Hello, this is Father Louis Skirty with Friends of the Word. We thank you for joining us for our weekly homily of the week. Today we're at this beautiful church of Our Lady of Mount Carmel in Cedar Knowles, New Jersey. We'll be celebrating here with this beautiful community, and I welcome you and thank you for joining us. If you'd like to be on our email list, contact me at lskirty at hotmail.com. God bless you, and thank you for sharing Friends of the Word. you <clears throat> a reading from the Holy Gospel, the good news, according to Mark. Jesus summoned the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the journey but a walking stick, no food, no sack, no money in their belts. They were, however, to wear sandals but not one second tunic even to be brought with them. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave. Whatever place that does not welcome you or listen to you, leave there and shake the dust from your feet in testimony against them. So they went off and they preached repentance. The twelve drove out many demons and they anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. With your wonderful alleluia, you can't not believe that it's the good news we're proclaiming. So it is the gospel, but that, of course, means good news. And your alleluia certainly bring that good news to life. Amos, you've got to be careful. You've got to be careful you think you're not good enough to do God's work. You've got to be careful that you think your role in the church might be attend Mass, put your envelope in, and come back next week, even as I see in the, in the entranceway with a bag of food or clothing for the poor in the community. We have to be careful that God has not chosen every one of us to do something special, extraordinary, like the Twelve, but before the Twelve. Amos. Who was Amos? Amos was a prophet. We know now because he's in the book that's called Book of Prophets. But he wasn't, he wasn't reared. He wasn't educated to be a prophet. He was educated, educated to be a farmer. Just a row of sycamore trees, he said. He, he worked with animals. He followed the animals around. He led them. He took care of them. Uh, some, some theories and some uh, commentaries say We'd be lucky if he took two, two baths a year. We'd be lucky if he had a tooth in his mouth. He lived on the land. He was a farmer. He was a dresser of sycamore trees. And some commentaries say, you've got to imagine the guy, when, when God tells him to go preach, we'll tell you what he's preaching, you, you can imagine what his reaction is. He's, you know, I'm used to uh, following my, my sheep, you know. And, you know, when you follow a sheep, you know the view you have? Think about it. Be creative. He's following his sheep. He says, now, you can't possibly want me to go preach God's word. I'm used to being close to the earth and not being in a position of respect. And when he gets there, Amaziah, who is the official. Now, you've got to realize this. We're going to metaphor it a little bit like it's the official church and the not-so-official church. Amaziah is part of the official church. The synagogue. He worked for the he worked for the king. He and the king were in cahoots. Real difficulty arises in our history, the world history, when we are involved in theocracies. Theocracies are when when the religious leader and the kings work together equally, or or, or the or the the philosophy or politics of the of the country or the tribe is religious, even though it's political as well. So. 
in Bethel was the temple, the official temple, and Amaziah, who's in charge of the official temple, he would be like in charge of our cathedral, say. And he says to Amos, get out of here. Go earn your money being a prophet someplace else. Now, prophets had a particular class of, of people that they hung out with. They were a little wacko. They were ecstatic. They're not the prophets we usually talk about or read about in our scriptures, but they're a little erratic. They even go into frenzies, in, into ecstatic frenzies, and, and they predict things and they say things. And, and the official Jewish community didn't really look too fondly upon prophets because they were a little wacko, a little, uh, you know, on the extreme. We have them in our society too. You know, doomsday prophets, we call them. But Amos wasn't one of those. He was called by God. He wasn't called by himself. He was called by God to go to the official temple and tell them that they have to get their act together because they're forgetting the covenant, which is feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty. And there's an example in, in, in Amos that he refers to, your, your rich are sitting on chairs of ivory and they're dropping food into their mouths and they're anointing themselves with cool, refreshing oil while the hunger continues in the community. And the poor and the widows and the hungry have nothing. But because they're part of the official synagogue, the official Bethel temple, they don't see that. And you know it, I know, in our society we have that exact same example still going on, thousands of years later, still going on. Great divide so often, not every day, but so often, between the rich and those who are in, and the poor, and those who are marginalized and out of society. Jesus addresses that eventually. And Amos responds to Amaziah who says, get out of here, you don't belong here. Hey, listen, I'm not a prophet. I don't belong to those groups of prophets, the company of prophets. The Lord took me from the flocks and said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Be careful if you don't think you're worthy to do God's work. God chooses every one of us to do something for him. And it's not bare minimum, not just coming to church. The bags of food and clothing outside, tip of the iceberg. The constant awareness of who we are, and we're going to get that mission in a second as we refer to the gospel, the constant awareness of the mission of who we are because we're redeemed by Christ, because we're born into the body of Christ, because in his, his, in his blood we are redeemed, we have forgiveness, because we are chosen in Christ. This is all the letter to the Ephesians as a reminder who we are. We're just not people. We're people in the world that belong to Christ by right of our baptismal promises, by our, our incorporation to the body of Christ, every time we reach out and say amen to the Eucharist, we once again renew our covenant with Christ. And then when we leave here, we can't say, well, I'll see him next, next Sunday, whatever Mass, or even tomorrow morning at the weekday Mass. It's constant. It's 24-7. Our involvement with Christ, our, our need, excuse me, it should be our need. But I'll call to be as his disciples. Now, the difference between a disciple and an apostle is clear. <clears throat> Apostles are sent, apostoli, sent out. Those who are the disciples, the sheepily, are the followers, the students of the master, whoever the master is. Some are called to go out and proclaim the good news in overt ways. Some are called to follow the word of Christ and live it in their daily lives. You've got to decide who you are. And, and don't ask me or a bishop or your pastor to tell you who you are. Each of us has to respond, as Amos responded, to the depths of our hearts. To be taken out of our comfort zone so often of, of being a shepherd or a housewife or a worker or a CEO or, or, or a teacher or a nurse. To, to be out of that comfort zone of vocation, physical vocation, to our uncomfortable zone of being a Christian 
which means overlapping Christ in everything we do, every attitude, every movie we attend, every, every site that we go on on our computers, every, every correction of our children, every, every temptation of infidelity. Who are we? Be careful who you're being called to be. Because we're being called to be members of the body of Christ, not just a parent, a child, a grandparent, a worker, a member of the community, music minister. We are all special, won by the blood and the redemption of Jesus Christ. So he sends his apostles off. You know, recently I traveled, recently I came back from retreat and, and vacation, and, and you know, when, when you get to the airport, it depends on what, what airlines you're, you're, you're flying, 25 bucks for this, 25 bucks for that, you know, carry two bags, that's 50 bucks, you carry no bags, it doesn't cost you, but you can carry a big personal bag, you don't get charged for it, but if you have a little check-in bag, you'll get charged. It that makes it's so confusing. So Jesus was ahead of his time. He says, you know, when you travel, take nothing. <laughs> Don't even bother. No, not even your shoes. Leave them there. Okay, you've got to take your shoes off at the airport anyway. So, Lash your style, tutti cause. Let, let them stay home. Don't worry about it. Take a stick to support yourself and just go. Go do what you've got to do. And what were they sent to do? Things that you and I think, well, I can't. I'm, I'm never going to be sent. I'm never going to be sent to heal the sick. I'm never going to be sent to anoint the poor. I'm never going to be sent to, to raise people from the dead. I'm never going to be sent to imitate Jesus, anointing them, casting out demons. But we are. We're sent. We're apostles. We're apostles first. Discipoli second. All of us are sent, first, to do the good works. That little bag of food that you bring in is actually going to feed some. Now, see, you've got to put yourself in that position. Be in the shelter. Be in the, in the soup kitchen. Very few of us have ever experienced that. The humiliation of having to go beg for food should be gone from our society, but it's still here. The humiliation of going in maybe with your child to sit down at a group table for a meal you have no, you don't pick it off the menu, you get what's there. Or to go in with your family and get a bag of groceries that you left to someone so you can take it home as modest as that home might be because of unemployment, lack of employment, insufficient employment, or very other, various other reasons. Imagine what Jesus did with that. Jesus tied that bag of groceries that you pick up at ShopRite or Safeway or some other department store or food market. Jesus tied in ministry with that. So that when you bring this food and you leave it there and they come and they come from the mission and they bring it eventually into someone's home, you are, you are sharing Eucharist. What is Eucharist? Thanksgiving. You are sharing the body of Christ with people you don't even know. And you don't have to know. Part of the humiliation is being identified as the recipient. So we stay away from that. We just want to give to our sisters and brothers in needs through proper channels, through proper organizations in our various social groups. And when you do that, you've been sent by Christ to do that. Now, all of you who didn't bring any food today, this, this is not a guilt trip, okay? But you bring some in next week. But Jesus ties himself into that ministry. Maybe, maybe you won't put your hand on someone and heal him. But maybe you will, and maybe you do. Maybe you do coddle that little kid who's just going through a rough time, or that child, or that, that child, adult child who's lost a parent in maybe an unusual way, maybe suicide, maybe alcoholism. And you just there, you're just there touching, helping out, sitting next to. That's ministry. That's what Christ is calling us to do. Be careful. You don't think you're good enough to do the work of Christ. Now, you know what I'm doing. I'm preaching. I'm, I'm celebrating Mass. I could, I could go back to a story. I love this story. Uh, years ago in high school, I, I was a good student, but I was like a, a, 
Gomez de Gama, a thorn, you know, like a thorn in the, in the sides of the nuns. See, I went to an Italian, I'm not going to give, I went to Holy Rosary School in Jersey City. All the nuns were Italian. They understood me. They understood this, this, this is a pain in the neck. I mean, we were a class of pain in the necks. We were outgoing, we were loud, and, and, and loved. And they were, it was a, good, a very good community. Filipino sisters from Villa Walsh. I can't tell you what, the other order. When I went to high school, they weren't so, they weren't so loose. They weren't so understanding. I didn't understand this, you know. They were, I can't say anything. I can't name them at all. But anyway, so I, I got into trouble often. My homeroom teacher loved her. Her own name, Sister Marita. I loved Sister Rose Marita. She was, she was wonderful. And she, very, she watched over me in a, in a sense. Seemed like I got one of those to watch over me. Not as a nun, but a priest in a seminary and so on. So they watch over you. God sends people to watch over you. Even though you're a pain in the butt, like I was. And still am. So we used to, we used to get letters from the colleges and she would write on her, on her board, you know, you know, Joe Smith, uh, Seton Hall University, uh, this guy. And, and then she would, the custom was you get the letter and you go show it to the principal and the principal congratulates you. That's, that, that's the standard. Not so in my case. I was in the principal's office so often, one day she said to me, for the wrong reason, one day she said to me, Skirty, what do you think you're going to be when you grow up? Well, now this is a nun. So, so how could I get back at her? I, I, I hit her right where I knew as a, as a college, high school kid it would hurt. I said, I'm going to be a priest. <laughs> her response, very insightful response is, they'd have to be scraping bottom of the barrel. <laughs> I felt like Amos, you know? Okay. So, okay, time goes on. Louis Scurdy gets a response. First school, Seton Hall University. And I checked off divinity school. I studied theology. So Sister Rosemarita writes, Louis Garrity, Seton Hall University, go show this to the principal. No, I don't want to go show it to the principal. No, no, go, go show this to the principal. No, no, go, go show it to the principal. Okay. So I, long hallway, glass doors, knock on the door. What do you want, Skirty? Real pleasant. What do you want, Skirty? And I said, open the door, I said, they scrape bottom. <laughs> so... Through the years of seminary, 1973, the bishop of the diocese, Casey, put his hands on my head and made it official. Be careful who you are. God calls you. You're not bad enough. You're not troublesome enough. You're not unfaithful enough. You're not a sinner enough to not be called by God. Look at his original 12. One sold him out. One betrayed him. The rest ran away. The youngest one, the stupidest one, John, God bless him, the evangelist, is at, is at the graveside, at, at, at the cross with his mother. Because he was too stupid to run. He was naive. He was chosen also. Be careful who you are when you're chosen to do God's work. And there's one thing I guess we can take with us. He says, don't take your shoes, your socks, your bag, and money, and all that. Take Christ with us. Let Christ be our vade mecum, go with me. Take Christ with us. As you cross the street, as you go to the supermarket, as you make love to your spouse, as you discipline your children, as you eat at the table, take Christ with you. All the good things he's given us, the blessings of life, are there for us to enjoy, not to be greedy with. That's why we have to be faithful to all his blessings. But to enjoy and share them. Take Christ with you in all you do. All of us are meant to do that. Be careful you don't think you're not good enough.